is a way of thinking much more than a body of knowledge. So said the famous science popularizer Carl Sagan. Indeed, in today's world, the need to improve our level of scientific literacy is uh, assuming center stage in almost all aspects of our lives and in almost all corners of this world. But exactly what is scientific literacy? Why does it matter? Is it all about memorizing scientific facts? Welcome to part two of a special program called Science Matters, brought to you by The Point on CTTN in collaboration with the Chinese Society of Science and Technology Journalism, coming to you from the National Convention Center here in Beijing. My panelists have been Professor Lloyd Davis, Stewart Professor of Science Communication, Center for Science Communication, University of Otago, New Zealand, Dr. Zhou Zhonghe, Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Chen Xiaowei, co-founder of Wisnut, a platform providing solutions to small and medium-sized enterprises, Dr. Peter Daszak, president of EcoHealth Alliance, a U.S.-based organization that conducts research and outreach programs on global health, and Jason Socrates Bardi, news director at the American Institute of Physics. But first, let's play a game. I would like to ask some uh, true or false questions to see your level of scientific literacy. Um, so take out a piece of paper and a pen, or if you want, your, your cell phone, and uh, very simple questions. I'm going to read these statements one after another, and then you tell me whether it is true or false, and we'll unveil the true answers uh, altogether. Altogether, there are five of them. So let's start. Are we ready? Let's start. Yes, there, there you are. A light year measures the speed of light traveling in a vacuum between two distant objects. You can see rainbows at night time. Atomic bombs work using atomic fission. The Atlantic Ocean is the biggest ocean on Earth. Pure water is tasteless. So, do you have your answers ready? Let's see the correct answers. So. A light year measures the speed of light traveling in a vacuum between two distant objects. False, mm -hmm. because a light year is a measurement of distance. You can see rainbows at nighttime. It's true, although it's very difficult, although it's rare, but at times it is possible. When the moonlight is bright enough, when you have uh, water vapor in the air, you can see rainbows at night. Atomic bombs work using atomic fission. True. The Atlantic Ocean is not the biggest ocean on Earth. Which is the biggest ocean on Earth? Who knows? The Pacific, yes. So that was false. And finally, pure water is tasteless. It's true. So tell me, how many of you got all of these questions correctly? I think I got it correct. <laughs> Shall we? You didn't. I, I never saw a rainbow at night. And Mr. Bobby? <laughs> I never um, saw that. Also the rainbow, and I also have never seen a rainbow at night. And it's actually an interesting point because I think in some ways, uh, you know, I, I got that wrong too. we strike Sorry. at what we're, what we're familiar or unfamiliar with. And, and in some ways, that actually makes it more interesting. I mean, hearing that, uh, I want to read up on, on rainbows. Whoever sees a rainbow at night? <laughs> sure, sure. It's a, it's a tricky one. Um, somehow, our audience members seem to be doing very well. So, uh, Professor Davis, explain to us what is the idea of scientific literacy? Is it difficult? Is it difficult to understand? Is there anything surprising about it? No. Uh, uh, if we define literacy as just being knowledge of a particular area, like in, th in this case, science, then it's it's, it's not a particularly uh, difficult concept to understand, but it's how you go about it and what values you put on it. And for example, being able to memorize facts like that is not necessarily having uh, a very commanding uh, use of uh, science literacy. Science literacy is useful when you have a way of dealing with the world, of being able to think scientifically and to reason, would there be a rainbow at night? Could there? What is a rainbow? It's refraction of light and blah, blah, blah. And if I don't have a, a sun in the night, then maybe it's not. You know? And so uh, people that got the rainbow answer wrong, I don't think there was anything wrong in their thinking. <laughs> I think you know, I'm saying that as someone who got it wrong. <laughs> I, and, and that's far more valuable to me 
mm -hmm. than being able to simply recite the fact that you can get yeah. rainbows at night. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Joe, yeah. is um, scientific literacy only um, a set of, of uh, scientific facts that you memorized no. since childhood, or is it scientific but spirit, as Professor Davis not. I totally agree with uh, uh, Laird. I think, uh, uh, actually, I feel that, uh, yesterday I was asking a, a colleague who, who was involved in doing the survey of uh, Chinese uh, uh, science literacy survey. So since uh, 2005, the, 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 the percentage of uh, uh, public science literacy has increased four times. I, 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 I think that's really a, a great thing, a remarkable. I was questioning them, do you use the same stand as uh, normally used in other countries? Mm -hmm. They said uh, yes, uh, basically uh, very much to that standard used in the U.S. So I don't know exactly, I don't know the detail how they did this. Mm -hmm. Like uh, people, how, I don't know how people use, use their way to cal calculate people's intelligence. So I totally agree, uh, knowing knowledge, the, uh, memorizing the facts is, is, is okay, it's important, but it's not the, the most important things. Actually for me, I think the most important thing is teaching people how to uh, think scientifically uh, I think uh, that's a part of the scientific, mm -hmm. we normally say scientific spirit. Yeah. Uh, that's, all, that's, that's mostly uh, right. lacking now right. in the uh, majority of the Chinese public, I think. Yeah. Uh, Xiao Wei, what do you think are some of the important factors that uh, still enable this remarkable jump, right, four times in terms of uh, scientific literacy for the Chinese people? What do you think are the other factors in, in, from 2005 to uh, 2017? Um, I could only guess. I think it's a combination of the generation uh, of Chinese kids first, when China first restarted the campaign in uh, educating kids in science back in the 1980s. Now that generation of parents have come to age and their children have come to age. Um, and also um, the spread of the internet. Um, so in 2005, China was still um, catching up on the internet side and also mobile internet, but in 2018, that's far different. So it's a combination of the coming of age of students and later becoming um, parents um, in 2018 versus 2005 and, and uh, the spread of internet and mobile internet and social network. Mm. But I think there is, a, do, do you sense that there is a very strong push also from the society, all parts of society to improve the scientific literacy of the Chinese population? Have you, have you witnessed this kind of uh, efforts as well? Um, yes. Uh, in an ironic way, some of that is the competitive pressure to so-called succeed um, and also to survive, honestly. Um, these days in Beijing, everybody knows about the housing price in Beijing. Um, you really need to get ahead in Gaokao, the college entrance exam, so that um, parents start buying xue uh, fang, right, so, uh, in, in the school zones. and so. When you have that much pressure, knowing that your parents have put in their life savings and maybe your grandparents' life savings, now as a kid, you really have to study hard in school. Mm, that so may have contributed to that. That's a, a fortunate side effect <laughs> of an unfortunate <laughs> phenomena. You're talking about that. Uh, Dr. Dashak, what is your um, oh, feeling? Yeah. This is really, it's exactly the same in the U.S. And, and I'm, I've been in the U.S. for 20 years. My eldest daughter is 17, I have two daughters. My eldest has just become captain of the robotics team, so that's great. Now, what that means is every weekend, as well as homework, as well as any sports she wants to do, as well as any fun time, she then has to go away for a day and compete in robotics competitions for the next few months. These are tough times for young people, but it, I think that's a good thing. And if, if the competitions are in science, then that's going to drive R&D and it's going to drive interest. But to back to the key question, why do we need science literacy? Um, and I think it's something fundamental in all of us that understanding the world out there helps you do better in life. It helps you when you have a health problem, you understand why. It helps you when something doesn't work, you can fix it better. But now in, in a world where the, the technology is changing so quickly, 
It's fundamentally critical to every nation to increase scientific literacy. It's the same in the US, it's the same in Europe. Mm -hmm. And if we really are to create a society that truly benefits from these advances or just is afraid of them, which is, we're beginning to see in some cultures. Mr. Bardi, what do you th where do you think the United States stand in terms of scientific literacy and uh, any good practices you think that can be emulated by other countries? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm also the uh, parent of two school-aged children. Uh, my, my kids are 10 and 13, and so um, I see firsthand uh, what goes on. My daughter is not in a robotics camp or, or after-school thing, but uh, um, she does take all the STEM classes and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, so to answer your question, um, Let's step back a second because the last, uh, in the last session we were talking about funding and I think an important thing that needs to be said is um, scientific literacy is tied directly to funding in the sense that if people are more aware of science, if their awareness uh, of, of science and the dis discoveries of science is high enough, they're more likely to support funding for science. This is sort of a, a virtuous circle, if you will. Um, the better aware we are of the science, the more um, funding we're going to have for science, and you know, the, more, the better we're gonna, aware we're going to become mm -hmm. as a result. Yeah. What's the, what's the story of uh, New Zealand? Um, do people have a genuine um, curiosity for science? Does it have to, foster, have to be fostered? Is there enough resources to support that? I'd have to say, and this is true in the United States as well as New Zealand, and I don't know about China, education is the answer to science literacy. Our students are not embracing science, in the they're being educated, but the, there are what do you fewer mean? numbers. What do you mean? What are the symptoms of what you just said? Like their, well, their grades example, are lower, they're, they're not choosing science, scientists as a uh, career? Uh, exactly. That at a certain stage in our education system, in, in New Zealand as it's high school, the students make a decision about what subjects they're going to take. And at about 15 years of age, they have to decide are they going to take science subjects or not. And a recent report by uh, Sir Peter Gluckman, who was mentioned uh, at the conference yesterday, was that by 2020 in New Zealand, there will be no subjects, no science subjects, perhaps biology, but probably not, where at least 20% of the students specialise in it or take it at beyond being 15 years of age, what we call year 11 and so forth. So, it's really uh, a worrying trend. But what, what are the factors behind this? Mm -hmm. if, if I knew the answers, I wouldn't be sitting here. I would be, <laughs> I would be in New Zealand being fated with money and positions and that because we are really worried. We are really, really worried. I work at a university. Okay. If the numbers of students drop at the high schools, that means the number of students doing science mm. at the university is going to drop. Dr. Joe, what's yes. the China story here? For myself, I, I, I'm, I'm we're in uh, quite a good position. I think that's okay. Paleontologists, paleontologists in China are generally very lucky because uh, we have got uh, sufficient funding and uh, have the, one of the best resources for studying paleontologists. So, so for us, it's, it's okay. But for science in, in China, I'm still a little worried because I think uh, many students may get into the area of science as a career, but uh, I, I, I believe most of them are forced to get into career right then because they got uh, uh, really uh, interested into, into science since they were a childhood. So I'm actually uh, more, more concerned about the education. The Chinese education mm. has, I, uh, to some extent, has cured the cure. Not not a, not not a cultivated the curiosity mm. Mm. of students. I think that's the biggest uh, thing I'm worried about. Yeah, yeah, I know that's a big discussion actually among my Chinese friends. A lot of worries there. But if you ask any foreign foreign friends, they might say, well, uh, supposedly Chinese have a very good tradition for scientific inquiry. We always value education. Shall we? You're nodding your head. Uh, why their perception and our understanding are different? Well, Are the Chinese not interested in, in science or education in general? Science is not native to China. That's right. right. Uh, here, the gentleman, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but I noticed it's that your middle name, yeah. his middle name is Socrates. Yeah. Now, when they had Socrates, we had Confucius in China. 
And you see, the Western philosophy is science-based. The Chinese philosophy is wisdom-based. The driver of Chinese being um, interested in education largely is pragmatic. That's right. Right? It's economic. <laughs> Dr. Joe agreeing a lot. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I concur with Dr. Joe in that um, 20 years ago, I, and here I want to, again, make a very clear distinction between scores, test scores, and intelligence. So I don't want to say the brightest kids went into science, but I want to say the kids with the top scores went into science. Today, the kids with top scores go into economy, finance, investment banking. Now that's the difference. So I envy hmm. countries like New Zealand, because I think it's a sign of wealth when kids can pursue their interest Grass in history here. and philosophy. Grass is green. <laughs> he was you just complaining. Good. I don't know. Uh, um, Dr. Dr. Dashak, where do you come from originally? Uh, uh, the UK, England. The UK. Yeah. UK. So comparing those two countries, the UK and the United States, um, well, what's the situation? The UK has always had a huge um, uh, reputation for education still does and I went to a great school in England a great university um, my parents were very interested in, in us all my I've got two brothers doing well in school and doing well in our careers so I, I think back when I was a student it was really something special to be an academic a doctor and um, that was held in high esteem socially uh, if you're an academician that's even more impressive we've lost a bit of that I think that's one of the problems but look, uh, what are the solutions? That's what we should talk about. And one of the solutions is right in this room. Um, science um, reporting. Uh, people who write books about scientific discoveries and make them interesting. People like Michio Kaku, the physicist in the US, who children love and want to become theoretical physicists. You know, that's a cool thing for a kid now. Or, um, when, you know, when I was younger, Richard Dawkins, who was a geneticist, evolutionary biologist who was just so cool. He had the answer to everything. Um, when you see those people on TV, it helps a, develop mm -hmm. a role model. We need those in the West. I'm sure we need them in China too yeah. to make science cool again. And then hopefully when society appreciates science more, the salaries will rise and therefore they'll be rewarded yeah. in the correct yeah. way. Very interesting. Uh, generally the thinking goes the more scientifically uh, literate we are, uh, the more easily we are going to cultivate talent and then it's going to lead to uh, better innovation. Uh, however, when and how that passion starts is a good question. Yeah. That's why we went, we went out to some primary schools in Beijing and we interviewed some kids. Let's listen to what they say. I don't like it. I I to I want to be a mathematician because I like math and I'm good at it. Also, also I like thinking.长大，我要长大，我要我要画好多好多的画。暂时还没有想到，可能有更多的另外一种路更适合我。Actually, my dream job. Uh, uh, being a marine biologist, but if I can't be a marine biologist, I will be an archaeologist. But still, if I can't be an archaeologist, I will be a mathematics teacher. Hmm, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't If you be a Star, a famous star, you could earn a lot of money, or maybe be a millionaire or a billionaire. I want, still want to be a marine biologist. My favorite animal is sharks, and if I be a marine biologist, I could study sharks and other creatures living in the sea. There's um, an information explosion right now. Everyone is, have, is being filled with too many information, so they all they develop this kind of narcissistic idealism that they want to be self-centric, they're egoists. Therefore, they want to be more of a celebrity than a researcher. It's just showing that they just don't feel like studying. Hmm.
Yeah, very interesting. <laughs> Actually, uh, it was funny. Uh, my colleagues went out and talked to these children, and she came out. She came back and said, "You know what? The majority of the children don't want to be a scientist." Or when you ask them, uh, "Can you remember the name of a famous scientist?" They can only think of Einstein and, and not not many more. And uh, although they still think that scientists could be an important job, so. Um, what do you make of this? Com of course, this is not a scientific survey, it's just some random uh, chats. Mr. Bardi, what is your first reaction towards that? Well, <clears throat> I love the girl who was trying to decide <laughs> between being a marine biologist and being an archaeologist and you know, <laughs> something else. Um, well, I, I don't know that it's so different. I mean, uh, uh, I think it, if you ask children in the United States, they probably wouldn't be able to name a scientist other than <coughs> Einstein, perhaps Stephen Hawking, mm -hmm. but you know they might be able to go two or three deep and, and not much further. Mm -hmm. um, so, do, do you guys also agree that this is probably the general picture we're looking at, also coming from the previous discussion we had, that in today's world children generally have a less um, sense of identification with the scientific community? Professor um, Davis. Well, actually, I. I think what that survey exemplified is something that I'm very passionate about, and that is that most of those kids just didn't know what they wanted to do. And we make kids, children, specialize at such an early age now, mm. and I think it's much better if we have a, a broad education. Mm. So you have the arts, and you have economics, and so forth, and included in that is science. And you don't make them make a choice when they're young like that. And I think it makes for better citizens, better individuals, but I actually also think it makes for better scientists. If you have a broad understanding of the arts, it actually improves your understanding of the world and I think you function better as a scientist. In, in the UK, we specialised at 14 or 15. You basically you became an art or a science person. And I knew I wanted to be a scientist. It wasn't a big deal for me. In the, in the US, it's different. Even at university, They'll go to college and do a, a science major and a, bio, and a French minor or a languages minor. And I always thought that was strange. And you'll get people applying for jobs who have this mixed career. But I agree, it increases their breadth of their knowledge. And one thing about being a scientist that's really important is creativity. You have to sit and dream up ideas and challenges and hypotheses. And you actually have to be quite creative. Mm -hmm. And we need to embrace that creativity at the same time as we embrace very reductionist mathematical approaches. And that's challenging if we focus too early. Yeah. I think you're dead right about that. Mm. Well, I agree with that because um, mm. I completed PhD and postdoc in human genetics before I diverged away completely into mm. media. So I think focusing too early really limits mine. But mm. I'm very thankful for what science taught me. That's the tool of thinking analytically. Yeah. Well, basically, the theme of this, this round of our discussion is the media's role. So we know all the problems. We have identified some of the problems. What can the media do? Right? Today, we're doing this discussion. Mm. I, very uh, helpful. Very, uh, I hope it is helpful. I, I'm thankful that you're part of it. But what can the media do better, Dr. Zheng? Have you thought about it? The, uh, for this survey, I only ask uh, primary school students. If I ask uh, uh, middle school students, probably the answer would be different. It uh, doesn't mean it would be uh, more positive. I mean, so I would expect um, uh, more kids at that age, like uh, choosing career like a biologist or archaeologist. That's uh, quite natural. But the key point is that uh, many of the students uh, made, made a choice uh, with the inferences of the internet or by their parents before they go decide to, uh, to study what, career, uh, what major in colleges. Mm -hmm. I think the parents are making the decision for most uh, of their kids. What uh, about, what I think about, that's a problem in China now. Yeah. Yeah. What about what they see and what they hear on the media? Um, I, I, I do want to come and focus on the, on the media part here, shall we? Uh, from, okay, uh, for media, Chen. I have mm -hmm. one point. I think uh, the propaganda of the Chinese media, I think, uh, should be responsible for, uh, for kids, not choosing science. One, one aspect, right? Uh, all the heroes, scientific heroes, like in, in China, are those people who, ruled, who have been working really crazy uh, until they died. So uh, that, uh, that, that's not good. 
but in my opinion, that's not the right way to no, when you, when you show example feel like of a scientific hero or okay. draw, draw a model for kids. Mm. Their parents would be very much worried. Mm. They don't want to have a career as a scientist <laughs> to be living in such a poor career. Mm. But unlike in other country, like talking about uh, uh, scientists on TV, they're showing a beautiful life, their passion for animal and plants, that's a different, a different role model. Yeah. I think that's important. I think we all know the, the TV uh, opera, um, The Big Bang Theory, right? Everybody loves it. I watch it a lot. Um, um, Mr. Body, how do you look at shows like this in terms of uh, making science more popular, making science more accessible? Really, the media can do three things to enhance literacy. Uh, one is the, the media, journalists can act as an intermediary between the scientist and the public. So there are those, those great examples of scientists who are great communicators, and we see them, we admire them, we love to, to hear what they're talking about. But not every scientist is necessarily a great communicator, and I think that the journalists can play the role of communicating out to the public um, the very interesting stuff that they're working on. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing that the, that, that the, the media community can do is um, just simply uh, uh, illuminate what's happening, but in a way that shows the process of science. So it's not just simply uncovering facts as if they're laying around and you discover them, but it's really piecing together the way a detective would um, these things. And, and, and I've often wondered, I mean, you know, in part to answer your question about uh, fictional shows, um, you know, there are a lot of great detective shows in the United States. I don't know about in China, mm. but, you know, it's really one of the most mainstream types of, uh, of entertainment are detective shows. Um, but there are, there really are very few um, science detective shows, but in a way, it's the same kind of process, piecing things together. Um, Dr. Dashak, what, has, what have been some uh, successful examples in your public outreach work to make health issues more interesting, to attract yeah. more young people to the career? Well, it, it, it's, it's actually easier on the, the work I did, which is emerging diseases, Ebola, SARS, swine flu, these things people are scared of. So that makes for great TV. So there is a plethora of TV shows all about emerging diseases, some of which do a really good job of getting to behind the scenes where did the disease emerge and spread, who was affected. There are movies now, Contagion is a good example, based on real stories of what happened. But I think that this needs to be picked up for every aspect of science, exactly correctly as was just said, we've got to tell a story and the story has to be in, as interesting as a detective story. It has to have some heroes in it and scientists as heroes, not just because they're charismatic, because often they aren't, but because of the incredible amount of work they've done to find out that nugget of information and because of the beauty of, of what it tells you about the universe or the planet or the world. And you know, I think you, you mentioned Carl Sagan earlier on in the early part. Um, he was a, a, an American TV um, astronomer. He was a real scientist, of course, published scientist, but just had a passion for the discovery, for the process, and for the amazing wonders that were explained by science. That's where we need to go back to. That's what enthralled me as a child, and I'm hoping we can recapture that now. As uh, Carl Sagan said, science is a way of thinking rather than... Um, body of knowledge and how to cultivate that way of thinking in the new media age is even bigger a challenge. With that, we're going to wrap up this special program on the point called Science Matters in collaboration with the Chinese Society for Science and Technology Journalism. Thank you for watching this program. Many thanks to my panel of guests and many thanks to the audience members for having followed us. As usual, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with LX. Download the application called CGTN to watch the show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. See you next time.